Hi everyone. Good morning. Um, <laughs> it's very good to be here. Um, my name is Julio. I'm a CTO and co-founder at Fractal ID, and uh, we've helped hundreds of uh, companies and projects in the blockchain space over the past five plus years um, work on identity verification. And I, I was here on DAPCON last year talking about um, what that meant for us, how we saw our product. Uh, I talked about uh, the importance of not being an identity maximalist and of delivering identity solutions that folks using Web3 today need. And um, I talked at the time about the, the spectrum of products that Fractal ID offers, but I'm, I'm here today to talk to you about like the next level of that. Um, and that's the IDOS. It's the identity operating system. And it is born out of a very pragmatic approach to how folks in this industry like to use identity. Because this industry is unlike any other, as you know. We've got a very particular ethos, we've got a very particular tech stack, and we've got a very particular type of user. And uh, identity verification is something that is extremely messy. Identity itself is something that is extremely messy. And to do it well, well, you're very often working with regulatory compliance, which is also extremely messy. And you're very often working with supporting users, which is also extremely messy. And so even though we've seen a number of solutions emerge over the years, we've always seen folks stay away from the actual hard work of identity verification. So we, we've built a lot of um, technically impressive deserts that uh, don't really meet the needs of the market as it is today. And so the IDOS is born out of that insight that we have, the experience that we've built, but it is not just built by us. So I'm, I'm very excited about this still. This is still being built. We're launching it in November. And um, it was hard for me to fit slides into 20 minutes because there's so, much, so many trade-offs that go into building this thing. And I really like to talk about them all, but well, we can't. So um, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief introduction of what, what this is and why we're building it. And I'll show you a few of the technical details about how it works uh, under the hood. So um, the IDOS is uh, a chain agnostic protocol for self-sovereign data management. And we will see what that means in practice, but the TLDR is your keys, your data. And uh, the chain agnostic part is critical because, well, I mean, Web3 isn't just Ethereum or just Gnosis or just Solana, right? And folks use dApps wherever they are. They're not going to know where they are soon enough anyway. And so we need a solution that works for everyone everywhere. And that's why we have such a, an odd collection of building partners for this that we're looking to expand in the, in the short term. If you're building an identity, do please reach out. And that is because like, even though we've been doing this for a while, we can't do this alone. This is something that we're trying to build as a common good for all of the space. And we need good partners with good use cases and good perspective and alignment with us on identity to push this forward. And so um, Quill is a strong technical partner that we have that uh, built the underlying data storage that I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, Near has a very, very keen focus on adoption and user onboarding that we can relate to very, very much. They're very pragmatic in that sense as well. They're integrating the IDOS into their blockchain operating system for the Near.org gateway. We're working with Gnosis, as you've heard many times and you'll keep hearing. Gnosis Pay allows you to have a self-custodial visit debit card, which is a highly regulated use case for which the IDOS is also very well suited. We're working with Aleph Zero, who is a very strong privacy team who are building a compliant version of Tornado Cash. Identity underpins all of these cases, and so we're helping everybody build this together. Um, hmm. All right, there we go. So, um, I mean, if you're in this talk, you probably know a little bit about like why decentralized identity hasn't been done right yet, and um, why do we need it in the first place? And the fact is that most of our interactions have already moved online over the past couple of decades. What's getting increasingly harder, what is new, is how easy it is to confuse you with a bot, with an impersonator. This erodes trust. 
And that trust is required for, I don't know what's going on here, but uh, <laughs> that trust is required for human interaction and for us to be able to coordinate and thrive. And coordination is one of the core tenets of blockchain technology anyway. And so ignoring identity as a core part in that is something that, well, um, I don't agree with. And it's also very important that what we build here, just like everything that Fractal has been built so far before, is not something to show off a piece of tech, and it is a product that is used for actual people in the space with, a, with an actual user base. Now, why are we doing this personally, Fractal? Fractal is a, what in the decentralized identity context you would call an issuer or an attester. We do identity verification. And the reason that we're, well, there's many reasons why we are doing this, um, but uh, one of my, uh, personally, one of my favorite ones is that I have to secure a database with over a million passwords. And first of all, I shouldn't have access to this database. This data shouldn't live with me. And second of all, this is a gigantic honeypot that we need to serve our customers, and I don't want to have it. And so the IDOS decentralizes the storage of this data and removes control from us. And we're going to see how that works in a little bit. But this shows, a, this shows an approximation of how Fractal would work today. We've got user accounts, we collect their data, verify their identity, and then folks that consume this have different options to integrate with us, whether or not they need the underlying data. Um, but this has a number of problems, uh, um, and well, we'll see that in a second. So what we're doing next is we're first launching the IDOS in parallel to our current system so that we can still later this year get rid of it. So this destroys the honeypot that now we have to secure and everybody else has to trust. And What's also cool about this is that there's, we have no special privileges as Fractal. Again, we're a partner in building this, and any other a tester, say a credit score, an identity verification company, whatever it might be, they can also use the IDOS with no, any requirements that we wouldn't have. Um, so this is a level playing field for everybody, and we think that competition is going to be very healthy here. But the coolest part is that everything that we've built so far always relies on us being around and doing a good job forever. But what the IDOS does is allows Fractal to disappear. If we build an ecosystem where other people contribute data and information and insights, then we've built a common good that doesn't require us to be around or folks to believe that we're going to be around. Now, this is great for users because your keys, your data. Um, you are the only person in control of the data that is in your profile, and you can edit it, add to it, delete it, and you decide who you share it with. You do this without needing special tooling like identity wallets to carry your data around and requiring you to be present for every interaction. You don't need soulbound tokens to dox you on chain. You need the IDOS, and it's got a much better UI anyway. Um, the, um, for dApps, this is good because they get a guarantee that they haven't been able to get, after, to get before, which is their user data is stored in a compliant way, and it is stored in a way that allows for retrieval once the user is no longer in your DAP. And we're going to see how that works in a little bit, but something that we're really trying to make sure happens is that folks copy as little data as possible. And so if you need some information about a user or might need get access to that data rather than the actual data, because this will, well, discourage duplication. And um, again, we're not the only ones playing here, so this is not a closed system, this is a public good. Now, the IDOS is a, uh, as I said before, it's a network of um, decentralized storage nodes and an access control protocol. And for you to be able to pull data from the IDOS or read data, write data, whatever it is, you need a signature. And you can only read that, you're the only one that can read data that's associated with your wallet, and you're the only one that can write any data against a profile that is associated with your wallet. Once you have an IDOS profile, you can rotate that wallet. You can add 10 more. You are the signer. You are the only party that can get access to this. And through 
say, the data dashboard that we're building, through any DAP integration that is building on us, and in general, just using our SDK, it's very, very easy to control the data that you've got stored against you. And to be able to, well, help other people get access to it. Access grants are a core part of the system where somebody can tell you, you can access this data tomorrow and you don't need a signature from me to do it. Again, you authenticate with the IDOS with the signature and I can pull my data or I can let you pull my data tomorrow with your signature instead. You don't require me to be online. Don't duplicate if you don't have to. These access grants can optionally be configured with a time lock. This is something that I can tell you, hey, you can have access to data ID 42 that belongs to me, or you can have access to that for a whole year. And what that does is it prevents me from deleting the underlying data or deleting this access grant. This is particularly relevant for uh, some AML KYC compliance use cases that I'm very familiar with, where many jurisdictions require that you still have access to the underlying data for five years. Again, this is entirely dependent on user consent. They don't have to give you the access grant. This is an option to bring the system into compliance. Right? Now, for dApps, they can also think about this, about it's not just identity verification. It can be a whole backend for their data. Uh, data privacy regulations and how you are supposed to store data that belongs to your users and the rights that you need to give them, I mean, they're not particularly complicated to implement, to be honest. Just don't be an asshole. Do the right thing. Put them in control, and it's going to be fine. But this is a minefield. And if you don't need to maintain your own backend, if you don't need to maintain your own database because the data lives with the user on their IDOS, it's, well, one less concern that you have, and it really helps them with things like data portability. And the data in the IDOS is stored, um, well, most of it, in the form of verifiable credentials. So this is a, it's an interoperable W3C standard that a lot of decentralized identity tooling knows how to consume and to operate with, and our tooling helps data be written in this form to facilitate portability and interoperability wherever we can. Now, let's look in detail uh, about a couple of things of how this works internally. So, uh, decentralized storage is uh, not done with uh, IPFS or ceramic or any solution that you might know, because while uh, those are great as well, we wanted to go with something that more resemble the relational database, which is something that is a lot closer to the normal data workflows that we are used to using and developers are used to using. And so this system acts, instead of it being a file store, it acts as a relational database driven by SQL, as you will uh, know. And this, this gives us some interesting affordances. Um, so what does this database look like? This is an earlier iteration, but you should get the idea across. Uh, you having an IDOS profile means that you've got an entry in that humans table up there. And everything that is associated with your profile, attributes, wallets, and credentials, have a human ID, because this is a relational database. So the way we know if an attribute belongs to you, if you can read it, if you can modify it, or how you can add a new one, is by looking at wallets as signers that are related to the corresponding human. And that's how we determine ownership of own data. Now, because there's also data grants, grantees are also, um, oh, sorry about that. Grantees are also like uh, subject to access control here, obviously. And so when you ask the IDOS for your data, it checks, do you own this data because you've signed it correctly and it's associated with your wallet. Grantee works a little bit differently. Um, so the IDOS, uh, just in terms of internals a little bit, uh, this is not code that you would have to write. Um, this is how we define the read and write operations that the IDOS exposes, for example, through our SDK. And um, when you, whenever you talk to it, uh, your public key and then address are extracted, recovered from your signature. So there's this add caller variable that you can then use in later queries as we're going to see. So say, for example, that you're trying to get somebody's credentials of a certain type, for example, KYC, and of a certain issuer, for example, Fractal. This is a very, very standard query to get that information, except 
we are joining it with the wallet's table so that we can match that the caller, the signer of the message that was just received by the IDOS, indeed has access to the data that they're trying to get. Now, access grants have this, they're from a data owner to a grantee for a certain piece of data, and they include this optional time lock. And this changes the logic of how, what the IDOS does in the background a little bit. So to give you an example, like this is a simple interface in Solidity for, we've got several of these contracts because we, we, we need them deployed on the networks that people use for the wallets that they, are, that they have installed. Um, and they, this is relatively trivial in terms of functionality. So you can only insert a grant for data that you own. So you have to be the grantee here, obviously. You can only delete a grant for data that you own as well, that is yours. For a grant that you created is something that only you can delete. And inside the IDOS node, instead of seeing, hey, who's signing this message trying to get this data, and matching internally in the relational structure, what we do is we check these contracts to see if there's still an active access grant that would give this new wallet access to this data. And time locks, are, time locks are enforced in the contracts and in the IDOS nodes by not letting you delete grants or data that are associated with something that you promised somebody would last until, say, next year. Now, the IDOS itself, the storage system doesn't really care what you store in there. And so if you're storing personal information or anything that is sensitive, then you need to make sure to encrypt it. And our tooling does that all by default. So all of the data that is stored in the IDOS in this database, anything that is sensitive, is something that not even node operators, the folks running these databases, should be able to access. And so the keys for decryption and encryption, they're generated privately in user land. We've got an enclave in our SDK that makes sure that data dashboards and dApps and anybody else integrating it can't get access to it, and that is how the user is able to do cryptographic operations on the data. So we take a password or a seed phrase from them, and we use a, a key derivation function in order to extract a key pair on AD25519 to perform the encryption operations over this data so that, well, wallets don't really offer encryption interfaces that are very consistent these days, and so this way we make sure that the user is in control of the password that they have. And again, this is done via the SDK that we have, which doesn't have to, right? You want to use the terminal, you want to have your keys under your full control inside your air gap machine, you do that. Um, kind of skip ahead of this. This is just more detail on the same. Um, well, uh, an interesting corollary of this is that when you're storing data in the IDOS, uh, you need to be very careful not to encrypt things that you shouldn't. So <laughs> if you're authenticated and authorized with your wallet address, if you create a new wallet and write it against your profile, if you encrypt that address, the database engine is going to have no idea how to match it. So there's guidelines about what should be and shouldn't be encrypted. Something that we're struggling with at the moment, and that I would love some input if anybody has any ideas, is how to prove that when I take a piece of data that was requested off me and I re-encrypt it with your key to create an access grant, to prove that I actually re-encrypted the right thing. We've got a few mechanisms around to kind of mitigate this issue when we were thinking of others. Um, and of course, data can always be shared directly, but this is something that is not one of our core skills. So if anybody has any ideas, I would love to hear them. How can you build with this? Well, user SDK. This is very, very trivial. We abstract a lot of the um, IDOS operations from you. You're essentially just going after reading and writing data, and our SDK will make sure that uh, it is prepared for encryption with the user, it gets their password if it doesn't remember it, and it does all of those operations in the background. So you take a signer, uh, like MetaMask, for example, you initialize the IDOS with that, and then you can perform straightforward operations like current user, like who is here right now, what's their IDOS profile? 
How do you get credentials from them? For you, this is one line. There's a lot happening in the background. The user will often have to sign a message, prove to the IDOS that they can get this data. It will need to be decrypted with the key derived from the user's password. The SDK deals with all of that. All you need to do is ask for credentials. You can create access grants based on objects that you have seen with the SDK or otherwise. And you can later get access to it very much like you would get access to a piece of user data, except it's you signing instead. How do you verify these credentials? Well, they're very powerful credentials for a reason, and our SDK helps you do that. And I am out of time. I was going to tell you about a couple of things that you could do with this, um, but I think that the examples are enough, and uh, I will respect the clock. So thank you all very much. And if you folks have any questions, I'd really, really love to take them. Awesome. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we'll, because of time, we'll just take two questions. I can see the gentleman over there, and there's a gentleman in front here. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned there is this enclave in the SDK that you like to generate this key. What could be attack vector on this enclave? Uh, the browser, for one. So if you don't trust your browser, your browser could be leaking. Uh, they could be not implementing the W3C recommendations on iframe sandboxing, for example, and that could eventually lead to the DAP. There's, uh, there's other ways that we've thought of um, dealing with the user password and the key. Uh, we didn't want to build an extension to deal with that. It's something that we will, because there's going to be a subset of users that will prefer that additional layer of security. But uh, so far, we haven't been able to break the iframe sandbox in any way. It's something that's been around for over a decade now, standardized. And so it's something that a DAP will not be able to get access to um, because of the cross-origin uh, policy. Thank you. And also, is there any computation layer, or you're leveraging something like TEE or computer data or similar things? Not yet. No. That's something. That's the kind of service that we would love being uh, to see being built on top of this. So the credentials that we generate, some of them have selective disclosure capabilities. So you can, you know, disclose only a subset of the credential and maintain the proof. Zero knowledge proofs on top of that would be a really interesting mechanism to create derived proofs from them. But on a level above, being able to use aggregate data to reach conclusions without actually inspect the underlying data is something that other folks have built already uh, and is something that I think is going to definitely be a very common use case of this. It's a bit of a next level target for us, and we will likely work with partners towards um, making sure that that happens. Yep, thank you. Well, thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, understand the point that obviously you have a, a database underlying um, where you store the credentials and, and all the um, uh, yeah relevant relevant traffic. You also said you have file storage. Um, no. You no. don't have file storage. No, so, so th that was a, the uh, decentralized database as opposed to traditional uh, decentralized uh, storage, which is file based. So this is a relational database, something similar to SQLite, uh, and uh, with a consensus protocol to make sure that all of the database nodes reach consensus on data modification. OK, right. Mm -hmm. So that makes it clear. Because I thought if you have data storage, that would be kind of defy the purpose, because you want to offer your service yes, to all data yes. storage. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please, let's put our hands together for Julio Santos again. Thank you. Thank you, folks.